This is Rick Malone for the San Francisco Symphony. The years following his 40th birthday in 1810 were not easy for Ludwig van Beethoven. Vienna was occupied by Napoleon's army for the second time in five years, and given Beethoven's political leanings, especially when it came to Napoleon, this was a bitter pill to swallow. He was also in the midst of several family disputes involving his younger brothers and their wives, some of which led to legal actions. He was having problems with his own love life. He had none and was desperate to change the situation, but was having no luck. And he had become a kind of serial renter, moving from apartment to apartment every few months. By some accounts, Beethoven lived in as many as 60 different apartments during his 35 years in Vienna. And by 1813, he had become almost completely deaf. Fortunately for Beethoven, as well as for the rest of Europe, Napoleon's forces suffered a crushing defeat at the Battle of Leipzig in 1813 and began to retreat out of Germany and back to France. The Bavarian and Austrian forces tried to block Napoleon near the German city of Hanau, but were soundly defeated. Back in Vienna, a concert was organized to benefit the families of the Bavarian and Austrian casualties, and Beethoven was asked to provide music. The concert turned out to be one of the wildest successes of Beethoven's career, although not quite in the way he intended. The concert took place on December 8, 1813. Everybody who was anybody in Viennese society was there, and the orchestra was made up of the best musicians in town, including Louis Spohr, Giacomo Meyerbeer on timpani, Ignaz Moscheles playing the cymbals, and Johann Hommel and Antonio Salieri manning the ceremonial canon. Yes, canon, because Beethoven's new symphony was not the featured work on the program. The concert was produced by Beethoven's friend Johann Meltzel, who would go on to invent the metronome, as well as some very sophisticated ear trumpets for Beethoven himself. Meltzel had just invented a contraption called the panharmonicon, a mechanical instrument that was the forerunner of the orchestrions and calliopes that gave carousels their distinctive sounds. Meltzel had asked Beethoven to write a piece for the panharmonicon, but when the instrument couldn't play it, Beethoven rewrote the piece for orchestra. He called it Wellington's Victory in honor of another defeat of Napoleon, and it's a crazy everything-but-the-kitchen-sink kind of piece involving patriotic hymns, battle effects, and, yes, cannon. The audience went wild for it, and even though they enjoyed Beethoven's new symphony enough to call for an encore of the second movement, it was clear that the smash hit of the evening was Wellington's victory. The entire concert was repeated three times in the next two months, giving Beethoven the financial security he needed to begin another burst of composing. The symphony that had its premiere at that historic concert was Beethoven's seventh, and even though his odd-numbered symphonies have acquired the reputation as his serious symphonies, this one is also nothing but high spirits from beginning to end. It starts with one of the longest introductions Beethoven ever wrote. In fact, it's one of the longest introductions to any symphony. It lurches from tonal center to tonal center in a way that must have been startling at the time, but which makes perfect sense to us now, since it foreshadows the transitions that form the structure of the entire piece.
Gradually, the introduction distills down to a single note, a repeated E, that slowly morphs into the rhythm that will propel the rest of the movement. Beethoven was a master of rhythm, able to take a seemingly simple pattern and put it through its paces, building an entire work out of just a few notes. He also loved extended endings, first movement ends with that simple rhythm repeated over a grinding off-kilter bass line. The second movement is the one that Beethoven's audiences loved so much they asked to have it encored at every concert. In the symphonic structure of Beethoven's time, this is where the slow movement should be. But this one is slow only in comparison to what came before. Given the occasion of the premiere and the earlier example of Beethoven's third symphony, some writers and conductors have tried to turn this movement into a funeral march. But the tempo marking is allegretto, which is not slow at all. And the central trio has some of the feeling of a country dance.
the movement ends exactly the way it began, with a sustained chord in the winds. Scherzo is Italian for joke. Beethoven loved a good joke, and it was he who first replaced the symphonic minuet in this position with a scherzo. The central trio of the third movement may or may not be Beethoven's interpretation of a pilgrim's hymn, but its essential function is to set up the rest of the joke. It works so well, Beethoven repeats it with a few subtle variations. Every good joke has a good punchline, and this one certainly does. The finale of Beethoven's Seventh is an ecstatic, crazy whirlwind of rhythm, a perpetual motion machine that never lets up. Like the first movement, the coda of the finale is based on a grinding bass line, but an even simpler one distilled down to just two notes. It may or may not have been a celebration of the coming defeat of Napoleon's armies, but Beethoven's Seventh Symphony is a prime example of music written for the sheer joy of making music. Carl Maria von Weber heard it and concluded that Beethoven had gone insane. Richard Wagner called it the apotheosis of the dance, and Beethoven himself referred to it as one of the happiest products of my poor talents. You can find out more about the San Francisco Symphony's programs at www.sfsymphony.org. This is Rick Malone for the San Francisco Symphony.